Dear students, welcome to the course of Architecture and Town Planning. I am your teacher, Ravinder Kumar Khyani, Assistant Professor, Department of Architecture and Planning, NAD University of Engineering and Technology, Karachi, in Pakistan. Today, our topic of discussion is modern planning in Pakistan and abroad. Before beginning of description about modern planning in Pakistan and abroad, it is important to understand the term modern and the phrase modern planning. Then secondly, it would be interesting to develop a historical perspective of planning attempts made abroad in Western world and then in Pakistan, particularly with reference to master planning, development of planning institution in Pakistan, and development pattern of settlements in major cities and towns of Pakistan. And it would clarify us about the theme of current lecture. So let's begin our topic with the understanding of modernity and modern. What is modernity and modern? Modernity is a term that refers to the modern era. It is distinct from modernism. It refers to cultural and intellectual movement of the period from 1630 to 1940. Early modern period refers to the period from 1500 to 1800. Basically, it is the industrialization which have given birth to the modernization and modernity. And industrialization during the 19th century marked the first phase of modernity. Then, furthermore, while in 20th century marks the second, uh, you can say, uh, phase of modernity. And modernity covered developments that basically occur around the globe and it is the uh, aspect of the creation as well as destruction of the cities. Because in uh, early uh, 20th century, there was first world war and then there was a second world war which destroyed a lot of cities in the world. And basically, the rebuilding process of cities uh, give birth to the modernism and modern planning. And that is called modernity and modern. And also, it is referring to the modern way of life. Now, let's go ahead and see modernism and modern planning. What is modernism and modern planning? The modernism describes a cultural movement rooted in the changes in the Western society in the late 19th and early 20th century. The term also covers a reforming movement in art, architecture, music, literature, and applied arts. Based on the ideas of Lee Carbuzier and utilizing new skyscraper building techniques, the modernist city stood for the elimination of disorder, congestion, and the small scale of city making. There were plans for large scale rebuilding of the cities in the modernism and modern era, that is modern planning. The most prominent example of entire modernist city is Brasilia, constructed between 1956 and 1960 in Brazil. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, many planners were coming to realize that the imposition of modernist clean lines and lack of human scale also tended to sap vitality from the community. The modernism can be said to have ended in 1970s when the construction of cheap uniform tower blocks ended in many countries, such as Britain and France. Furthermore, planning then concentrate on the individualism and diversity in society and economy, and that is called the postmodernist era. Now let's uh, discuss about the modern planning abroad. What has happened abroad? In order to understand the modern planning abroad, one may refer to the Encyclopedia of Urban Planning by Wittig Honor and read the contemporary theories and practices in the Western world. It narrates that since 16th century, the mode of planning cities is divided in seven main categories. First is the authoritarian planning. Second is the utilitarian planning. Third is romantic planning. The fourth is utopian planning. Fifth is technocratic utopia. Six is technocratic planning and seven is organic planning. So let's discuss about the authoritarian planning in the world. It is basically a geometrical planning of cities which emerged in 16th century onwards. 
The principles of this kind of planning include a long street, uniform block front, and an open plaza for a monument or obelisk. The ideal geometric plans for the political capitals was the main uh, thing that had happened that all over the world there was capital cities built. And these capital cities building is authoritarian planning because they wanted to show their authority over the people and based on that the cities were developed. And there are many political capitals developed. These include Washington, the Brasilia, the Islamabad. The plan becomes truly functional setting only for the government. But for the people, it was a different story. The basic element in geometric planning is a square or rectangular blocks with the streets and avenues composed by assembling and extending such blocks. The major advantage of this gridiron planning is open spaces provided as a setting for major public buildings. The disadvantages of this planning is the automatic extension by this method and it raises the cost by increasing the number and area of unnecessary streets and pavement. Well, let's go ahead and see the planning around the globe. And that is utilitarian city planning. The utilitarian city planning is also termed as commercial utilitarian planning because its main objective is to maximize the return from the sale and the rent of the land. Since last three centuries, large number of new towns and town extensions developed on this theory. The utilitarian planning is the encouragement of the private sector investment in the development. And the utilitarian planning has been carried out on a day-to-day -day basis by the municipal engineers, the land developers, the transportation experts, the commercial builders, and real estate investors with no thought of public welfare or municipal economy and the only thing is utility of the services and income generation. Then another trend across the globe is of romantic city planning. This is also important aspect that when the utilitarian planning practice becomes supreme in cities there occurred a revolution against it and a new philosophy took place in the form of romantic movement in city planning. The romantic planning rejects the concept of the uh, that make uh, take the concepts of life that makes human being and its environment subservient to other political powers structure or mechanization in the development of the city and you can find there are different examples around the globe about the romantic planning the romantic movement restored the historic heritage and fresh appreciation of the natural landscape where the designers and planners think about the city its people and its life and they wanted to make the life better of the people. The romantic planner reduced the cost of development and create more open spaces or recreational spaces for gardens and public buildings where social interaction can take place. From historical point of view, the romantic movement was developed in a theory by Camilo Cite in his work entitled The Art of Building Cities. Mr. Camilo Cite contributed the concept of diversified neighborhoods, markets, squares, and green open spaces rather than uniform avenue and blocks as the basic unit of planning. And these principles were further elaborated by Mr. Robert Unwin in his book, Town Planning Practice in 1909. Then another, you can say, global movement of modern planning that took place abroad is of utopian planning. What is utopian planning? As far as utopian planning is concerned, the utopian planning at first referred to the Thomas Moore's classic work of Utopia, in which he exhibits the elements of all three types of authoritarian, utilitarian, and romantic planning. He describes a neighborhood unit as a center of domestic and civic life, and he emphasized that there should be a neighborhood unit developed for the better life of the people. Apart from Thomas Moore's, there are also other utop utopian planners, such as Robert Owen. It gives an ideal scheme of New Lenark, Savannah, and uh, there was uh, Georgia and Melbourne with a large surrounding green belt. And he promoted that there should be a green belt and green open spaces. Mr. Walter Burley Griffin, who planned the city capital of the Australia, known as Canberra, in which he suggested the generous scale of suburban planning 
And then there was another big pioneer planner and architect, it's French Wild White. He developed the broad acre scheme for the uh, city of Paris. And he talked about different, you can say, uh, open spaces and green spaces and organic planning of the city. The most successful example of utopian urban planning was that of Sir Ebenezer Howard's project of Garden City, which has affected a lot in the world. And in our uh, city of Lahore, there is a uh, place known as Model Town. It was based on the concept of Garden City. Furthermore, let's go ahead and see what had happened abroad. Then there occurs another planning uh, style that is technocratic utopia. The term technocratic utopia was first brought into the literature by the Bowler Lytton through his work, The Coming Race. The inhabitants of this utopia lived underground and utilizes nuclear energy for both work and the destruction. The technocratic planning basically mainly centered on the technological invention, inventions in the construction methods and materials. Whereas the organization of city will be on the linear pattern along a spinal transportation artery. The most popular uh, and influential form of te te technocratic idea is of the Le Corbusier, the city of the future, and which is published in 1934 and known as an urbanism or the urban way of life. Apart from technocratic utopia, there were also technocratic planning that occurred abroad. What is technocratic planning? Technocratic planning is basically the planning which uses the technology. The aim of technocratic planning and ideas is to make every urban activity a function of a machine. In theory, technocratic planning assumes that all human problems are open to a technological solutions and all human needs can be met by the invention of mechanical or electric, electronic device that can stimulate people and satisfy their needs and divert them to other channels. The technocratic planning suggests that the projects for great uh, mega structures or mega urban structures, great underwater structures, the underground and mile high towers in the air with great urban mega structures that maximize the totalitarian control on the people. Then finally, another, uh, you can say, modern planning that took place abroad is organic planning. What is organic planning? The concept of organic planning uh, sprung out from the rich knowledge of urban past and better sociological understanding of the nature of the city. The organic planning conserves past urban forms and prepares them to accommodate future needs. The essential nature of the organic planning can be best revealed through the historic cities in which growth and development takes place throughout centuries with the fourth dimension of time. Now, after having this understanding about the modern planning abroad and the philosophy of the modern planning, let's go ahead and see what it has resulted uh, in the Western world and around the globe. Around the globe, there occurred the modern planning that took place around the globe lead us towards the inequality. And cities basically brought an inequality trap. Let's see a small video and you'll understand what I actually mean by it. Cities are incredible generators of economic growth and well-being, yet there are also inequality traps, potentially. Home to billionaires and beggars, cities in nine out of 10 countries studied by the OECD show higher levels of inequality than the national average. And two thirds of the cities we examined had higher readings than the national average. When urban housing and transport are poorly planned, they can increase segregation of labor markets and restrict upward mobility for city dwellers. With more people living in cities all the time, especially in Asia and Africa, it is crucial cities do not become drivers of inequality. By 2050, 70% of us will live in cities, up from around 50% today. Data suggests that as cities grow bigger, they become more unequal. This means reconfiguring the way cities work, improving access to education with voucher programs, investing in skills training 
and entrepreneurship, making housing fairer with well-targeted allowances and fewer barriers to house building, easier access to services and cheaper transport with better routes. Government must join forces at all levels to ensure that our cities work for all. So you have seen how city become the place for inequality. Let's go further and understand it, what we actually need to do in this context. The modern planning abroad clearly gave us an idea that globally we need a proper urban policy for the future. And there are various institutions who are working for this issue. Let's see an uh, issue, uh, you can say a case study of a uh, you can say group or you can say uh, an organization working internationally for the uh, global problem of the urban policies for the cities for the future. By the year 2050, 70% of the global population is expected to live in cities. In an increasingly urbanised world, cities can bring major benefits to their residents, their countries and the global community. Cities boost productivity, innovation and job creation, they offer higher wages and income, they attract skills and talents and they're major providers of culture, leisure and other amenities. But, if they're not managed properly, cities can also generate costs. For example, traffic congestion, long commuting time, air pollution, unaffordable housing and inequalities. Successful cities do not happen automatically. They require effective local and national urban policies. Globalisation, digitalisation, ageing population, migration, climate change and other megatrends are profoundly transforming the way people live and work in cities. So, a key question is, how can cities continue to generate growth, offer high quality of life and be fit for the future? The OECD has worked on cities and urban policy for over 20 years. We've developed internationally comparable data on cities and their performances. We've advised local and national governments on their urban policies in more than 30 cities, ranging from Seoul to Mexico City, and almost 10 countries, ranging from Poland to China. We've carried out thematic work on a wide range of sectors of urban policy, such as climate change, ageing, migration, inclusive growth, metropolitan governance, land use and water. We've set up policy networks to share good practices and learn from each other, such as the OECD Working Party on Urban Policy, the OECD Roundtable of Mayors and Ministers, and the OECD Champion Mayors Initiative for Inclusive Growth. What lessons have we learned from these two decades of work? The OECD principles on urban policy, adopted in March 2019, have taken stock of these lessons to advise policymakers at the national, regional and local level on how to shape smart, sustainable and inclusive cities in a world of constant change. The OECD principles cover three major dimensions of urban policy, which can be summarised around the three S's. Scale, strategy and stakeholders. The first S targeting an effective scale of policy of action in all cities. Governments should maximise the potential of cities of all sizes to advance prosperity and well-being, adapt urban policy to the places where people live and work, and support interdependencies and cooperation between urban and rural areas. The second S, adopting a coherent, integrated and effective strategy to build smart, sustainable and inclusive cities. Governments should set a clear vision for national urban policy that is fit for the future. Leverage the potential of cities to advance environmental quality and the transition to a low carbon economy. Promote inclusive cities that provide opportunities for all. Encourage coherence across different sectoral policies and provide adequate funding for urban policy. And finally, the third S, engaging stakeholders in a co-designed, co-implemented and co-monitored urban policy. Governments need to promote stakeholder engagement in the design and implementation of urban policy, strengthen the innovation capacity of actors in cities and foster monitoring and evaluation and accountability of urban policy outcomes. The OECD stands ready to support policy makers around the world to make the principles on urban policy happen. So you have seen 
how globally people working for the cities and what their lessons they have learned and they wanted that these lessons should be learned by other people. Now let's go ahead and look at what we have done in our country and we, how we plan our cities and what was the modern planning in Pakistan. After understanding the modern planning in abroad, let's focus on modern planning in Pakistan. It is predicted that by 2050, about 64% of the developing world and 86% of the developed world will be urbanized, equivalent to the approximately 3 billion urbanites by 2050, much of which will occur in Africa and Asia. United Nations projected that all global population growth from 2020 to 2030 will be absorbed by cities. About 1.1 billion new urbanites will occur over the next 10 years. Urbanization in Pakistan has increased since the time of its independence in 1947 and has several different causes. Most of the southern Pakistan population lives along the Indus River and Karachi, Hyderabad, Larkana and Sakhar are the most populous cities. In the northern half of the country, most of the population lives in the arc formed by the cities of Lahore, Faisalabad, Rawalpindi, Islamabad, Gujranwala, Sialkot, Gujarat, Jhelum, Sargoda, Shahupura, Noshera, Mardan, and Peshawar. The causes of urbanization primarily are immigrants from the various parts of the world to Pakistan. Before going into the details about the modern planning in Pakistan, it is important uh, to understand the background of the legal framework for the planning and the development. This is significant because we must know who is responsible for planning and development and what are the causes and lack of planning in majority places. So let's begin by understanding the legal framework for town planning in Pakistan, a historical perspective. There has been no country and town planning law at the national level in Pakistan. For the preparation of the master plans by the local council, municipal administration ordinance came in 1960s. However, this ordinance did not say anything about the plan sanctioning and implementing authorities, nor it contained any provision regarding the, requiring the revision of the plans and as and when needed. The municipal uh, administration ordinance 1960 was replaced by a provincial local government ordinance PLGO in 1979. And then urban local councils were required to prepare master plans for their jurisdiction under the PLGO 1979, and it was also not mandatory to do so. Thus, country received no planning attention. The local government ordinance then come in, 19, uh, in 2001, and that has replaced the PLGO in 1979 as part of the devolution plan. Under the 2001 ordinance, each province has been divided into districts by eliminating the uh, previous rural-urban divide. Each district comprises a few tehsils or towns which are again divided into areas of the union councils. Under the 2001 ordinance, all the TMAs are required to prepare a master plan for their respective areas and get it approved from their respective councils. The provisions for master planning can also be found as one of the functions of the various development authorities or planning agencies in their respective acts or ordinances under which these authorities or agencies were created primarily in large cities. For example, these include Karachi Development Authority, Order 1957, Lahore Development Authority, Act 1975, and Quota Development Authority, Ordinance 1978. The other major aspect to be understood here is about the preparation and implementation of the master plans by the authority. The preparation and implementation of the master plans. Initially, when Pakistan came into being in 1947, within three years there was a mass migration from India. The most refugees mostly, the Muslim refugees mostly settled in the urban areas of Sain province, and as Karachi was the capital, so Karachi seen a major social change. In 1951 to 53, a consulting firm Merz Randal Watan MRB of Sweden developed the first master plan for Karachi known as MRB plan, but it generated a big social debate and plan was not implemented. Then in 50s decade of, uh, there occurs internal migration took place due to floods in Punjab and many people migrated to Karachi. 
as the country had limited resources and social debate in 50s not much town planning occurred and big cities become ugly this is the situation of karachi in 50s decade recognizing the need to improve the haphazard growth of big cities the master plans for 11 major cities were in the stage in 1960 to 65 the 60s decade was the era of industrialization and green revolution due to mechanization in pakistan and urbanization took a great uh, change in pakistan as a repercussion again internal migrations occurred and people moved from rural areas to urban areas of pakistan and then the master plan for greater lahore was developed in 1961 the master plan for karachi developed in 1970 to 74 the master plans have also been produced for various cities of the country including for instance quetta peshawar rawalpindi faisalabad and multan karachi in 60s decade waited for town planning and there was not much uh, uh, town planning took place in karachi and this was a situation you can see in the 60s decade in karachi this is how the city look like then further going ahead the most important thing that we have to understand that master planning for islamabad city is the major town planning activity that took place in pakistan so we must focus on the master planning of islamabad city islamabad represents pakistan's first newly city project as a capital of the newly independent state this is the master plan which was developed in 1958 the oxidus and associate of greece provided the generous public spaces for each class of community by an ecological analysis of the four main categories of natural landscape the mountains and the hillocks and the plains and the valleys uh, of pakistan master planning of islamabad city let's go ahead and see in islamabad the city was designed with the concept of integrating nature and the city with the scalar arrangement of the landscape this is like the analysis of the landscape which was uh, carried out the plan of islamabad shows connectivity on all levels within the city natural landscape and other systems of open spaces to create an urban system that is connected to natural area surrounding the city this was the concept of the design Uh, on the basis of a hand and the fingers that are uh, you know the expansion of the city islamabad is the planned city with an extensive road network laid out in the grid structure the greater islamabad alpindi metropolitan area is the third largest conurbation in pakistan and with over 4.5 million inhabitants the city was built during the 1960s to replace karachi as pakistan's capital located in the potwar plateau in the north of the country islamabad is a well organized and most developed city divided into different sectors and zones and here you can see the master plan of islamabad divided in different sectors and zones the city is home to faisal mosque the largest mosque in south asia and sixth largest mosque in the world here you can see the islamabad architecture is a combination of modernity and old islamic and regional traditions the river son islamabad existed since the stone age so this was a quite a great place where the city was formed from 1947 to 59 karachi was the capital and creation of the new capital was debated in karachi to be at a distance of 15 to 20 miles in new karachi the doxiatus and associate the ca doxiatus started advising on the location and planning of the new capital in 1955 In March 1959 it was decided to be located at the foot of Margala Hills at the western west of Jhelum River where Alexander defeated the king Porus. And this was the initial sketches of the uh, master plan of the Islamabad. The master plan of Islamabad and Rawalpindi as developed by the Doxiatus in 1965 is uh, evident. Here is the divisions of the uh, plan. You can see simple squares and rectangles were developed. Planned from 1959 to 1963 by a Greek architect, planner C. A. Doxiadis, and started implementation of this uh, city in 1961. There were various housing schemes were developed. The site is directly connected to the G T Road or Grand Trunk Road by providing the access to existing transport network. The city was conceived into a grid iron pattern developed into two kilometer by two kilometer sectors. Segregated by the hierarchy of white principles, 
60 feet road. The sectors were used, used for distinct uh, land uses such as residential, educational, commercial and administrative. And this is like the land use plan. Housing is uh, provided in grid iron pattern sectors on discipline hierarchy of communities according to their income groups. Here you can see Islamabad and Rawalpindi conurbation. It is in a in the square grid of sectors, four communities clustered around an enlarged shopping center to slow down traffic. Shopping activities were organized in the center of the larger square settlement. The city is divided into eight basic zone types: that is, administrative zone, diplomatic enclave, residential area, educational sectors, industrial sectors, commercial areas, rural areas, and green areas. And here you can see different uh, zones. Each sector has its own shopping area, a green belt, and public park. It is designed on the basis of the ideal city plan of the future to form a Dyna metropolis. This is how this is the, the neighborhoods were developed. Each community has a population of 20,000 to 40,000. This was the envisaged inhabitants and it is divided into four communities. Each composed of four more communities. The communities are spatially defined and accessed by major arteries at two kilometer by two kilometer intervals. These arteries may be gradually upgraded to freeway depending on the increasing traffic flow. They are developed within 180 meter wide transportation corridors where high speed public transport may also be accommodated. And short length minor arteries of 90 meter right of way are spaced at about one kilometer distances, defining class four communities in which pedestrians can safely walk along a system of local roads, wide sidewalks, and pedestrian roads leading to the local center and function. There is the planning of the street network by the extensive use of cul de sacs and loops. The cul de sacs is like a uh, you know, uh, street which is having an end. And there was car can remove inside these human communities without interfering with the pedestrian. So this was a good quality of the plan that pedestrian and vehicular movement is separated. Transport system is planned with a hierarchical system of communities within 120 feet wide corridors of grid iron pattern, local and collector, low speed roads, sidewalks, pedestrian roads and cycle lanes. And here you can see the major artery uh, of the and the service road. Hierarchical pattern of 120, 60 and 30 feet wide roads and communities connected to the collector road designed as a cul-de-sac. By the extensive use of cul-de-sacs and loops, car can move inside these human communities without interfering with the pedestrians. And here you can see the major arteries and the road network. The houses were constructed in rectangular blocks, so convenient, economical, and most suited for the building construction. This advantage of this system is no shortcuts to provide a direct access to the market. And this is like a total plan of the city. The master planning of Islamabad. You can see that every space have a central, you can say, market and open space for the public interaction. Islamabad, the, uh, the occidentals have developed different principles of social planning, pedestrian and vehicle traffic. The making of the plan Islamabad is an in, you know, investigation and prospection into the landscape of the area chosen as project site for the new capital of Pakistan. The idea, concept, and proto form of the Danapolis as conceived by Doxy others, is bound to find its manifestation in Islamabad. The translation of Danapolis into a physical plan guided by its proto form landscape and the institution uh, of the architect is what I describe as the making of the plan of Islamabad. Here you can see the plan application of Doxy Brinson. There is this uh, Dana Metropolis, Islamabad, the sketch indicates growth of functions into the direction of city's future expansion. This is unity of the scale. There is a national park which was developed. And here you can see how Islamabad look like right now. Now, let's look at what other people uh, say about Islamabad, how the planning is. Let's see this small video. The world is home to both natural and man-made wonders. Rapid urbanization, however, has created mega cities, which have a lot to showcase in terms of man made wonders, but less, much less, to offer in terms of natural beauty, history, and natural habitats. 
very few cities of the world have kept a wonderful balance between their modernization and preservation. These cities are an epitome of excellence to live, work, play, visit, and experience. Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan, is a class of its own that has preserved its natural beauty, its heritage, and still has made great strides of development and modernization. Islamabad was selected by a commission of experts in 1958 after an extensive study. Its location, climate, proximity, and natural beauty has made it an ideal contender for an ideal capital. The site of the city was not only beautiful, it has a historical significance as well. It goes back to the earliest human habitations in Asia. This area has seen the first settlement of Aryans, ancient caravans passing from Central Asia and the massive armies of Tamerlane and Alexander. In pursuit of creating an ideal city, an organization as visionary as the capital was born. CDA, Capital Development Authority, was established in June 1960. As an authority, it has the power, duties, functions, and responsibilities for planning and development of the capital. It also performs functions as the sole civic agency for ensuring the well-being of the capital and its inhabitants. It has been more than five decades the authority has kept its promise and its resolute commitment to its duties and responsibilities. Today, Islamabad is not only one of the best cities of Pakistan, but easily one of the best in the world as well. The witnesses of the very fact are diplomats who have been around the world, overseas Pakistanis who have lived for years in the developed world, journalists who have covered international cities, photographers, artists, tourists, residents, and even critics. The CDA, if it's, they do a, a good job, hopefully they will clean the city and make it even more and more uh, uh, beautiful. All the time, uh, there are a lot of flowers here. Twitter is very nice because uh, it's, it's warm and at the winter time, it's like really good. It's not too cold and not too hot. Green city. Green. Yeah, everywhere is green. I like. Uh, I like Islamabad because uh, Islamabad is very uh, green city, and weather is very nice, uh, and food is very nice. I like Islamabad. The best thing in Islamabad that I like is the people. A Greek firm of architects, Constantinos Apostolos Oxidias, designed the master plan of the city with its apex towards the Margla Hills. Since then, CDA has kept it intact. It has been divided into different zones and sectors, each with a distinction of its own splendor. Each day, the golden sunshine travels through the blue skies to meet the numerous shades of green in the city. The area of Islamabad is 906.50 square kilometers. Less than 25% of it is classified as urban area. Almost 25% has been dedicated to parks whereas the rest, 50%, is classified as rural area. There's a policy for environment at CDA. If cutting of trees becomes inevitable for development, CDA plans to plant four more trees to compensate for that, to keep Islamabad sparkling with colors of Mother Nature. Islamabad has the highest literacy rate in Pakistan at 88%. This is due to the fact that it houses some of the most advanced educational institutions. 
The Sector H of Islamabad can be classified as an education city with sprawling campuses of leading universities where students from around the country and even around the world come to study. With a healthy environment, Islamabad has a solid health infrastructure. It has multiple hospitals, both from the public and private sector, competing with each other in a health excellence. People from across Pakistan come to Islamabad for treatment. The city has a healing power of its own that naturally treats any mood swings. Parks, clubs, malls, cinemas, sports facilities, restaurants, hotels, thrilling rides, graceful events, sights, and sounds, along with the mesmerizing climate of the Four Seasons, each with its own color and excitement that keeps the life of Islamabad a beautiful life. This century is defined by speed the metro rapid transport system, wide roads, and now the underdevelopment Islamabad signal free corridor will ensure that the city keeps flowing with all its exquisiteness and class. The city offers an ideal mix of serenity, academic excellence, human resource, technology infrastructure, and macroeconomic indicators. But Pakistan's economic corridor gradually reaching its logical end, Islamabad will be a regional economic hub for visionaries, professionals, and skillful human resource, not only from Pakistan, but the entire world. The future of Islamabad looks as green as the city and as golden as the sunshine that touch the city every day. Capital Development Authority will ensure that the city is always mentioned as one of the best cities of the world, everywhere in the world. So you have seen the much planning of Islamabad city. I uh, must stop here. Next, planning for the uh, Karachi uh, city, master planning of the Karachi city. The Doxiadists and Asuas also developed the Greater Karachi Settlement uh, Resettlement Plan or Greater Karachi Plans with North Karachi capital and Malid and Thorangi and as industrial city. However, with the planning of new capital, these projects were not completed and Karachi waited and waited for planning and reform. In 70s decade, people went abroad and started sending remittances and construction industry flourish in the middle metropolitan cities and Karachi is one of that. This is Karachi land use plan 1970. Whereas war with India also brought migrants to the urban center of Sin and Karachi and developed uh, as the large metropolitan city of Pakistan. And this is like a land use in uh, 1987. Furthermore, by the end of the 70s, due to Afghan war, migrants came to Pakistan. In the 80s decade, this trend continued. And due to Iran Iraq war, people again migrated to Pakistan urban center. And this is like the Karachi development plan. In 90s decades, small industrial cities flourished in Punjab and the rule to urban migration caused the urbanization in Pakistan. Furthermore, in 2000 decade, due to war of terror again, Pakistan uh, faced the people's migration from Afghanistan to Pakistan. And then in last two decades, the real estate business boomed a lot and Karachi developed in the real estate sense. And again, migrants came from the different cities of Pakistan to Karachi. So Karachi became a largest mega city uh, of the Pakistan. We will dis uh, discuss this in detail in the next lecture, but I must end my lecture because uh, uh, I've taken too much time. Now, these are the references which I have uh, mentioned about the uh, town planning uh, with uh, the, the references uh, the, which I have read and prepared the lecture. And these are the video references which I have used and I recommend you, uh, you to watch these videos. Thank you very much. Finally, thank you very much for listening to the lecture. For detailed lecture notes, I already tell you to visit my blog www.townplanninglectures.blogspot.com. I thank you very much once again. Wish you good luck and see you in the next class.